talk about is a, a kernel TLS socket implementation. TLS being transport layer security. Could you, could you close, come closer to the microphone? Hello? Oh, okay. Uh, so from a high level, we're just making a new socket type, and you'll either instantiate it as a, a stream socket, so TLS, or a datagram socket, and you'll get DTLS. Um, so we've implemented uh, this at Facebook, and we're going to talk about our experiments, exper experiences, um, how well it worked, uh, and some of our results from running it in production. Uh, but first, we're going to do a little review of TLS, because I don't know if everyone is the most familiar with it. Um, TLS is the S in HTTPS. Uh, in HTTP2 or H2, it's actually the standard transport layer. So everything in H2 is actually encrypted with TLS, which means it's very widely deployed. There were some discussions on, like the last NetDev about like what are we going to do in the data center? Is it going to be IPsec? Is it going to be TLS? Is it going to be something else? That really isn't the choice you have on the wider internet. Everything is really TLS at this point. The versioning is kind of wacky. It was SSL 1, 2, and 3, and then it reset to TLS 1.1, 1.2, and the current draft is TLS 1.3. Um, so we're going to be going over the draft uh, pretty much in this talk. Uh, the draft is at draft like 16, I believe now, so it's pretty far along. So what is TLS? So TLS uh, is a security protocol. It has a handshake at the beginning. There's really two parts to it. There's the handshake and then the record protocol that does symmetric encryption after the handshake, which is public private key uh, asymmetric encryption. So just like uh, TCP, there is some sort of handshake at the beginning, uh, of which there's a bunch of different options here, and it's actually really quite complicated, and it changes quite a lot between different versions. So our approach was to essentially leave the handshake in user space. So before we started this project, I went and grabbed like the last seven vulnerabilities of OpenSSL. There's a list. I didn't list exactly what they were here, but uh, three of them were handshaking issues, like something that had to change in the handshake protocol to, to fix a vulnerability. Three of them ended up being bugs in the control messages. So you probably heard of the, the Heartbleed one. It was pretty recent in the, the Heartbeat messages. Um, there's also a couple different types of control messages uh, that had issues in them. And then the last one was uh, a cipher suite that happened to have found an attack against it. Um, so our approach also specifies the cipher suites from user space. So when you instantiate the socket, you also tell it what cipher suite you want to use. Um, so basically, all these issues would have been resolved uh, without having to change anything in kernel space. So the record protocol uh, looks something like this. Application data, for TLS anyway, comes in as a stream. Uh, it's fragmented into the, the maximum message size. It is optionally compressed. Uh, this graphic is actually a little bit old. It turns out compression uh, has been broken at one point as well. So no one compresses anymore. They compress their data first. Uh, then a MAC is added and it is encrypted. Typically these now happen at the same time, especially with like GCM protocols. And then finally the header is attached to the, the front of the record. So the max frame, max frame size is four pages, uh, 16K. The header is 13 bytes, uh, which is a little bit annoying because it's unaligned, uh, which it doesn't play quite as nicely with the AES and I hardware routines as perhaps you would like it to. Uh, it means you have to, to pad everything out. Uh, the MAC is 16 bytes. The first byte is the message type, uh, which uh, for our implementation where we are leaving all the handshake and control messages in user space, that's really the only thing we have to look at to know whether we are going to deal with the message or not. We just look at the very first byte. And the next four bytes are version and size, so you can figure out the size of the message very quickly. Uh, and then the next eight are nonce. Uh, nonce, if you're not familiar with crypto, is a number used only once. Uh, per the spec, this is allowed to be the sequence number, and most implementations do make it the sequence number. Uh, the reason for this is it's very easy to figure out if you've reused the number or not, uh, and you don't want to. When your sequence number wraps, you then have to go and re-handshake to make sure you don't reuse the same numbers. Control messages, there's a bunch of different types. Uh, renegotiate, uh, shutdown alerts, heart bleat, heartbeat. Uh, renegotiate is, of course, uh, redoing your asymmetric encryption to get symmetric cipher keys. Shutdown is important. Uh, when you want to close the connection, you actually have to send some control messages. Uh, this securely shuts down the connection so that an attacker can't go and try and continue your session. Uh, there's different alert types and heartbeats. Uh, 
as it turns out in practice, you really don't have to deal with any of these control messages. Uh, at least Facebook doesn't. Um, pretty much all, if we receive any sort of control message, we just immediately close the connection. We do go through the, the proper shutdown sequence. So the one we do deal with is shutdown. So our, our handoff looks like we do the handshake in user space. We put everything into the kernel and do all our symmetric encryption for our entire connection. And then when either side closes the connection, we finally put everything back to user space to do the, the shutdown command. And that's it. And so the, the one annoying part about this is trying to separate the data and control messages. Uh, the annoying part is that they use the same sequence numbers. So you do have to make sure that you manage the sequence numbers explicitly between user space and kernel space. DTLS, uh, we have like initial support for DTLS as well. It's pretty much exactly the same as TLS. You're, it is a datagram message, so you're allowed to drop the messages. It actually has additional complexity on top of TLS and then it implements its own sliding window. The sliding window is only for replay protection, so it's not terribly complicated. You just have to remember the last X number of messages to make sure an attacker isn't trying to send you multiple messages of the same uh, sequence number. Uh, this also means there's a little bit of extra state for DTLS that you may have to pass between user space and kernel space. So I said a TLS had actually won on the internet. It's not quite true. There are a couple others that you've probably heard of. Uh, Quick is one of them. Uh, Facebook has one. We haven't advertised it super heavily, but mentioned it a few times, called a zero protocol. Um, our version is exact. Uh, we actually took Quick's uh, encryption from UDP and used it in TCP instead. Um, so what this is trying to add is actually just a, a zero round trip handshake. Uh, what that means is just like TCP that has the, the three way handshake at the beginning, instead you can do like a TCP fast open. This is the exact same thing but for encryption where you can send some data along with the handshake and assuming the handshake is uh, successful, you already have some data to reduce latencies. So this is all planning to be in TLS 1.3 already. So while all these companies are experimenting with these different formats, uh, they're actually just planning for them to be in TLS 1.3. So it makes a nice target. Um, it's not actually a very fragmented space and everyone seems to be converging on the same thing. In terms of TLS 1.3, there's actually uh, only one other major uh, change in terms of the parts we're looking at. Uh, it actually calls almost all the old Cypher suites, uh, which is awesome. We only have to deal with two of them. Uh, GCM AES and Cha Cha Poly are the, the two that are in the spec. There's actually a third one, but it's almost never used in production. So uh, these are the two we're mainly looking at. GCM AES is the one you're probably familiar with. It's the ones that have AES and I hardware instruction support on Intel chipsets and a few other chipsets. Uh, this makes it substantially fa faster to do the crypto, but it's still taking up your CPU time. It's not any sort of offloaded anywhere else. So uh, as uh, opposed to that, uh, Cha Cha Poly, if you don't have hardware instructions, is actually faster to do in software. So chipsets that don't have AES and I hardware instructions uh, end up using Cha Cha Poly instead. Uh, and so for our use cases, this mostly means mobile applications that we have control over uh, end up using Cha Cha Poly while all of our server backends, if they're choosing to do the crypto that way, use GCM AES. So you can make this trade off of which end is going to end up spending the extra CPU cycles. Both of these are actually already in the crypto subsystem. Uh, the GCM AES required a few changes that I'll talk about, uh, but it actually it worked quite well for us. So I'll share some numbers of what our uh, actual production traffic looks like. Uh, GCM AES makes up like 80% of our uh, encrypted traffic, so it's quite high. Uh, Cha Cha Poly from mobile is about 6%. Um, and the older ciphers that are pre-13 ciphers that are going away is only 0.1% at this time and in, in going down, so it's actually pretty insignificant. These don't add up to 100 uh, because there is a bunch of data that I can't share. Sorry. Um, so why are we trying to do this? Why are we trying to put it in the kernel? Um, there's a bunch of different reasons. I'm going to list them out here and talk about them. Uh, send file, splice, standard POSIX APIs. Uh, 
Right now, if you want to go and use TLS encryption, you have to go and figure out the different libraries, so OpenSSL, GNU TLS, uh, whatever. They all have their own sort of interface. Uh, while our, our interface to the, the kernel sockets has improved with time, we have you know, send a message, we have send file, we have splice. Uh, most of the user space TLS libraries haven't gained these same things or very slowly. We've had to do a bunch of work retrofitting OpenSSL with, with a bunch of stuff that I wish we wouldn't have had to done, but uh, what we did anyway, um, which if we had the standard interface, uh, it would have just worked out of the box for us. Uh, so send file is interesting in that it actually might give you a performance increase. Uh, we tested this, uh, here's some mic micro benchmarks versus a bunch of other strategies. So the one on the left here is just SSL. We're calling read on some sort of static resource on disk uh, and then calling SSL write straight out to the network card. Uh, so we call that 100% of CPU, that's our benchmark. So that involves two copies, one from the kernel to user space and one from user space to the kernel after we've encrypted. We can avoid the kernel to user space one by using mmap uh, to try and map the file into memory. It does save a little bit of CPU, it looks like it's about 3%. We could try and use VM splice to save the other one from going from user space into the kernel. I never had much luck with it. It, of course, did get rid of the copies, but involved a bunch of extra VM overhead. Um, send file seems to be at about 7% from the baseline or 4% faster than MMAP, so um, the perf perf profiles look something like this. So the AES and I encryption cost is roughly the same, well, which is awesome. It means our user space and kernel encryption routines are performing roughly the same. Uh, and there seems to be some extra co cost here in the, the copying and the, the mapping of pages. So uh, almost exactly what I would have expected. In addition to just the API changes, uh, it also gives us access to the unencrypted bytes in the kernel. Uh, this is uh, the short term, what we ended up using this for the most. Um, and so this is BPF type programs. So we have something called the kernel connection multiplexer that uses this extensively. Uh, I'll talk about it just a little bit. Essentially, we're taking a single TCP socket, uh, usually on receive, and we're putting it through the multiplexer, uh, breaking it up into individual datagrams. So our use cases are RPC, so we use Apache Thrift, uh, but really any RPC service is probably some sort of datagram. Um, and H2, which is also some sort of datagram that you have the size at the beginning, and it's very easy to detect the size of the message uh, using BPF. We then have a bunch of sockets that are over here in user space, uh, all in different threads. Um, so what we're doing is just round robbing across these, choosing one that is waiting in ePoll to, to do something and giving it a packet to go and do something with. So we built the KCM on top of TLS when they're layered. Uh, so we have the TCP socket and then the, the TLS socket that's doing the decryption. Uh, and then the kernel connection multiplexer sits on top of that. Uh, since the bytes are decrypted, now we can use BPF in the kernel to read what the actual encrypted messages are and then send them to some, some socket in user space. Uh, so the main advantage of this is that we're waking up a single thread that's actually waiting for data. So we're able to parallelize this work uh, in user space. I tried to make a little diagram here to describe um, things are coming in, on, in from the kernel on one thread. Uh, and then in user space, there's a bunch of different threads that are waiting to do something. Um, they're probably having a bunch of different TCP connections in them. So they could be doing work for other connections. Um, but one, if one is free and just sitting there waiting to do some work, we'll give the message to it as opposed to trying to give it to, to some other thread that is currently busy. The previous implementation of this, we had uh, tied connections to threads. So all the requests on a single connection went to the same thread in user space. Uh, and then on top of that, user space would then pick apart the messages and then load balance again. So it required an additional thread hop that we're avoiding with this strategy. So we went and implemented all this and ran it in production for a bunch of different services. Uh, this is perhaps the most impressive result we got. Uh, TLS is mostly neutral. Right now we're just using the AES and I hardware instructions which are available in user space or kernel space so they don't affect, affect the results much. Uh, this one is not using send files so we're not seeing any improvement uh, in terms of sending CPU. Uh, so this is mostly uh, a benefit from KCM over the encrypted data. 
Um, so this is some services, P99 latency, so the tail latency, uh, the, the, worst, the latency of the worst messages over time. I think this is about a day. Uh, if you can't read the, the numbers on the left, they're, they're in milliseconds. Um, so the big peak was about a 20% improvement in latency, and the smaller peak over here on the right was about a 10%. Um, so we're seeing some improvement in, in tail latency. So you get access to unencrypted bytes. You could also do other things with this in BPF. Uh, if you're doing DTLS, you could also do a SOC reuse port has a, a BPF hook. You can choose explicitly which socket to actually give the message to, um, which is uh, very similar to what we're doing with KCM. Uh, finally, we have hardware offload. Uh, the whole next talk is about hardware offload, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much other than we have a choice of what the interface is really gonna be to the, the hardware offload if we're gonna do it. So we've implemented a socket type which is essentially saying to the kernel that we are going to encrypt this data and then we're going to send it out. Uh, it's, it's going to be going over the, the network. There's also an existing socket type, the, the AF alg sockets, the algorithm sockets, where you give it a block of data. Uh, in our case, it would be a, a one record of 16K for TLS. It would encrypt it all for you and then it would give it back to you. Uh, which means it's a little more flexible in that you could do the framing from user space uh, and then choose what to do with it. You could still splice the data around and like splice it out so you could get a very uh, rough version of send file going. Uh, the main issue is that it implies you're getting the data back and it doesn't know what you're doing with it after that. So if you wanted to put the offload on the network card, uh, it would have to send the data to the network card, encrypt it, send it back, uh, and then you have to add it to your, your TCP socket, and then it would send it off again to the NIC. So it'd be going back and forth uh, more times than you really want it to. This probably works just fine if we want some sort of other offload, like PCIe offload or uh, an onboard offload or something like that. Um, anyways, the point is that we're tying together the fact that we're sending the data out uh, with the fact that we're encrypting it. So we, we're giving a little more information uh, and it can specialize that a little bit more. Uh, so just some numbers from our production machines in terms of what this is currently costing us. Uh, we have a bunch of TLS terminators. Uh, looking at those, about 10% of our CPU is still spent doing AES and I instructions. So even though these are faster than doing it in software, uh, it still takes up like a lot of CPU. It's quite expensive. Uh, one through 2% is spending doing avoidable copy to and copy from user for our CDM machines. So this is static resources from disk uh, going straight out the network uh, that we're currently copying into user space, encrypting, and then, and then sending out. Uh, none of our internal services currently use send file or splice at all because they're all mostly written after uh, TLS had become a thing. So we just didn't even bother. Like we can't use them at all right now. Um, so this kind of exists. We've known it's there. Uh, and so we're experimenting now with trying to get rid of this one through two percent. Uh, of course, uh, just this implementation using AES and I doesn't get rid of this 10 percent cost for us. You actually would need some sort of offload to get rid of that. Uh, so asymmetric encryption is actually more expensive than symmetric encryption. Um, so just some explanation of why we've been focusing on the symmetric encryption. Uh, when you do a handshake, there's actually a feature called session resumption that if the user knows that it has previously talked to you, you can try and resume the previous session instead of doing the expensive asymmetric uh, in encryption. So our resume rate is somewhere greater than 50%. Uh, it's actually much greater than 50%, but I can't share an exact number. Um, so the more you guys log on to Facebook uh, multiple times per day, the greater our session resumption is, uh, which is awesome. So it, it's about 5% of CPU, so half as much and going down. Of course, when you're using it in the data center, you can actually control your pooled connections much more closely and perhaps even pre-share your keys. So uh, this is only really a concern with uh, the internet and external clients. Um, so let's take a, just a brief look at our implementation. Uh, so there isn't actually a whole lot left to do if you're leaving the handshake in user space and leaving all the control messages in user space. You just have to split the messages somehow into to control and user space messages. Uh, uh, you have to parse the framing. You have to deal with the sequence number management because both the control and data messages are using the same sequence number. You have to encrypt and decrypt things uh, and finally just deal with all the buffers that are flying around. <laughs> 
So currently our approach is to have two file descriptors to split the data. We have the original TCP file descriptor that anything you read or write from is just st sent straight out to the network. Uh, and so we actually give this one to our user space open SSL library or GNU TLS. We've tested both. And then we chain onto it uh, our TLS socket uh, that will decrypt the bytes. It peeks into the original socket at the first byte and says, hey, I'm going to either detect if this is a data message and steal the buffers and then decrypt them and send them out. Uh, so we give that one to our application to go and get the decrypted data. And then the only special logic between the two is grabbing the uh, the the encrypted encryption keys and IVs from uh, the OpenSSL implementation and sticking it in the TLS socket. There's other ways you could do this. Uh, you could use 1FD and have some sort of like stateful sock opt and make it work um, so that you would actually pass the FD between the two library implementations. Uh, there's also mentioned you could use the, the error queue to try and separate out the control and data messages that way. Uh, my biggest problem with that is that current uh, library implementations and user space aren't expecting anything on the error queue, so you'd have to go and either make a bunch of different shims or modify them to work with this. So it seems like a little bit more work. For parsing the framing, there wasn't actually anything that did this specifically as a library in the kernel before. So we added this stream parser library. It's currently used by the, the kernel connection multiplexer. Basically, it's taking the, the TCP stream data and finding the right points uh, and SKBs to make actual messages uh, and then handing them off to either KCM or, in our case, uh, the TLS socket. Sequence numbers, uh, this is pretty much all of the implementation in user space that you need now is the actual grabbing of the keys from your user space implementation and sticking it into the socket. Uh, and then at the right place, uh, grabbing them out of the kernel implementation and sticking them back in user space. And you actually do need to do both if you want to properly take care of the, the shutdown message. Um, some of the user space libraries right now don't actually expose their encryption keys. It's a little bit opaque. Uh, so we're actually working on getting some of those patches upstream to actually make it uh, so you can grab them in a reasonable way using a, a standard API. Um, so the crypto actually is uh, GCM. Uh, we have a software implementation for as well as the AES and I hardware implementation for. Uh, the hardware implementation was written for IPsec. IPsec's header is 16 bytes, uh, which is nice and fits in with the hardware instructions very nicely. Uh, TLS is 13 and is super annoying. We have to go through uh, and pad all the numbers out. So some minor changes uh, were needed to get the ASNI instructions working. Um, these crypto patches would be necessary even with the ALG socket. Um, so it, you need a little bit of work right now, even if you want to support send file uh, using the ALG socket. Uh, Buffer management uh, just is pretty standard, except for the fact that the me max message size is 4K, which means you always have to have uh, 4K available to decrypt the message. Uh, we're, of course, at Facebook dealing with the huge machines uh, with you know 32 gigabytes of memory, so it's not usually an issue. Uh, but uh, we do have to take care of the special case that uh, we have not enough of the data, or it's fragmented and out of order, that we don't have enough to actually put together uh, a crypto message, so we have to fail and, and hand it back to user space. Um, so this is the one case when user space may actually have to, to deal with a message somehow uh, that is n normal data and not a control message. Um, so just to review, 47% uh, CPU savings using send file, depending on how you want to count it. Uh, 10 to 20% P99 latency, depending on which service we were actually looking at. Um, and it provided uh, support for our hardware offload. All of our code is currently on GitHub, still needing a little bit of polish. Uh, we've only implemented the, the GCM AES portions of this, uh, so Shasha Poly should be next on the list. Uh, and the DTLS is, is kind of a work in progress at the moment, um, but it is very little change necessary to actually get it to work, so uh, we're probably going to support that too. Cool. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. So you mentioned in another slide that the, the GCM AASNI overhead sticks at 10%, right? And you're discussing ways to get rid of it. You also discussed on the previous slide that you have this four-page buffer requirement, and that gets tricky, and in certain cases you can ha fail partially and have to kick it down to user space. I think you can get rid of both things, the 10% overhead and this 
crazy buffer requirement. The thing that's missing in all of this is think about think about what's happening as you as you were eliminating peeling away layers of copies in this thing. So I don't know about you, but I'm a little disappointed that you only got a seven percent improvement for send file. It, it it should have been a lot bigger, right? Especially since all the data is being handled in the kernel, we're eliminating at least theoretically certain levels of copies, right? One thing the crypto layer isn't doing for you is combining the computational overhead of the AES-NI with the user space copy. And that's what needs to be added to the crypto layer. You need AES-NI operations that can uh, scatter into user space and scatter from user space. And that way the 10% just evaporates into the copy overhead. Also, you wouldn't need that temporary buffer anymore. Uh, you are correct. So we had an initial implementation of this that works for a very subset of cases. Um, yeah, the current GCM AES uh, implementation doesn't let you, it doesn't really do scatter gather, uh, and it's the main problem we've been running into is that it requires everything to be in a contiguous buffer. So right. uh, if your data lines up perfectly with what the buffer user, uh, user space is giving you, you can currently do it, but um, right. yeah, that's a piece of work that we can so definitely do. Th the key is we have to have the crypto layer support crypting in and out of user space. So. There'd be a shim with a dumb layer for all the algorithms that don't support it that do a copy afterwards out of a temporary buffer, for example. But the thing we really want is that piece of assembler that, that amortizes all the AAS and I costs in the copy operation itself. Just like we do for checksums for th almost three decades now. So I agree. I think that's where we need to go. Okay. And uh, so if we get to that point, do you also agree that we can get rid of the temporary buffer? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. I don't think any of that requires changes to the interface, though. No. Oh, it might, because you might not have to stick out the user space anymore. I, I think that for a send file, you will still have to use one copy, because you can't encrypt the send file uh, payload from the page cache. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's, it's an encryption. I don't know if it's a copy. Um, it's something that's there, yeah. Well, you need to copy it to another buffer to encrypt it. No, it's encrypted from the page cache. Then you modify the data in the page cache. N no, you're reading from one and writing to another. It's source destination. The crypto is from source to destination buffer, so... Yeah, but you don't want to modify the data in the page cache. It's not encrypted in place. So the crypto is done from a source buffer to a destination buffer. So you read from one and and write to another buffer. So you leave the data as it is, and the crypto operation you have to do anyways. So, right? Require uh, specific that you align the frame size of the TLS, um, that you align the sizes of the buffers you read to user space to the frame sizes, or do you need to have like lots of special logic to actually do the encryption on a full block, then store half of the unencrypted data back into the SK receive queue and just give part of it to user space? So, for example, if or do, do you also implement message peak? Um, with that peaking on a socket, like I, I want to read from data from it unencrypted, but I don't want to remove the data which is already in the queue. Right, we support that. Uh, right, right now it, it is on the receive queue. Uh, do you do two decrypts then, or do you just do one encrypt? Uh, just one. Just one. So you store out of band the decrypted data if it's already decrypted, and then hand it back. So we receive the data and then we decrypt it in place. Right, and then it's stored in the receive queue. Okay, but I, I was asking if you would implement the feature like David says, like you have basically have the data encrypted uh, in the receive queue, right. then you would lose those so, properties. So that would be an optimization that, yes, you'd have to make a copy in some cases and you wouldn't in others. Okay, thanks. Cool, thanks.